It's time to talk some uh, Simbaroom. I knew I was saying that right. My friends told me I was crazy. They were they were calling it they were calling it Simbaroom, and I'm like, that is not Simbaroom. That's Simbaroom. But uh, I actually got that confirmed by Simon before we went on the air. So thanks for coming on again, Simon. Totally appreciate it. It's going to be nice to uh, shoot the hay with you for the next uh, 40 minutes or so, 40, 50 minutes. And then we'll uh, we'll take some uh, questions at the end if anybody has any questions about the rule set or or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so we'll- I'm already seeing the, the comments uh, popping up about going to Davokar and loot that forest. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so how, rough place. how did you get into how did you get into gaming you know uh you know what did friends get you into it did you just happen to see a a copy of a an rpg book on a shelf that piqued your interest or uh the first time i started with rpg specifically was um at a friend's place and we were playing and they wanted somebody to gm because no none of them wanted to gm so my first session i came in and i hadn't even read the rules and i was supposed to gm oh that's uh, always fun yeah <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks uh but and this was back in i think it was 91 92 something so i was about 10 years old as well um but uh, we ended up spending about 14 hours straight, I think, and we started in the afternoon, so we were done somewhere in the in the in the morning. Uh, and I think about half past two, people f- started falling asleep, so it wasn't the the best session of my life, so to speak. <laughs> we always used to torture the people that fell asleep first. We would always like soap their hands up and put their hands in warm water to see if they'd pee their pants and stuff. It was uh, good times. <laughs> We would we would torture the people that want to sleep. <laughs> so yeah, your first fun. session was fourteen hours, huh? Yeah, yeah, completely unprepared as well. So that was a good thing. Uh, but after that, uh, I started playing as a player uh, a bit because I don't, we had to start taking turns in who wanted to be a GM because uh, uh, nobody wanted to play. So and we played the the Swedish. Uh, role-playing game that I told you about, uh, Draco de Mona, or Dragons and Demons in English, um, probably for three or four years until my character died and I stopped playing. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I bet that hurt, man. I bet that hurt big okay. time. I, I, I had his uh, character sheet uh, uh, on my wall for years afterwards. And like all the other people's characters like kept dying off, but and, and we always we started to zero XP. But mine just kept growing and growing. And he I just somehow managed to never die until we were chased by an undead army. And I was uh, I was a dwarf. And in that game, dwarves are really afraid of water. And I was about to cross um like a small stream, and I I uh, fumbled the roll and uh, I fell down with my face into the stream and none of my friends saved me. They just didn't give a fuck and wanted me to die. <laughs> and, uh, <got> up. <laughs> it was time for that character to die. He was pretty much unkillable. Oh, wow. Yeah, I actually, I had a couple characters die, but nothing, you know. I mean, if my 31st level basic D&D cleric died... I probably would have jumped off a bridge. I'll admit it. I mean, because I, I was so attached to my character. His name was uh, Jonathan Abadie, and man, that would that would have hurt big time. I actually still have his character sheet too. I have uh, I have like six pages of gems. I'm like, gems are just ridiculous. I got all these five gold piece gems. To, I'm like, I'll never ever do gems like that again. But now I'm playing basic D and D, and I'm going to do it. So yeah, we'll sorry, your button. Yeah. Button. So um, did you? When yeah. did you start playing like Dungeons and Dragons and stuff? Was that a little bit after playing Dragons and Demons? So, actually, um, in '95, I started playing a mud, uh, which is called uh, Three Kingdoms, and still runs. And it was like the first version of it was based on the D and D rules. Um, so I started playing that, uh, but it was a mix of different realms. So you didn't only see the, the Dungeons and Dragon classes in it. But it's a t- text-based uh, online MMO, basically. Um, yeah, I remember I, MUDs. They were fun. 
Yeah, I played up until 2011. Uh, so I played for a few years. And uh, I have a really close friend who lives in, in the States who I, I started known through, through the mud. Um, but it's not actually up until recently that I actually started playing d and I think that was just like two years ago. Uh, up until then, it's been all other kinds of R uh, R R RPGs, like Swedish ones mostly, but also mm -hmm. the, the Vampire Masquerade or Vampire of the Dark Ages is the one I played a lot. Pretty yeah, I, I never got into Vampire the Masquerade, but I always, I, I always wanted to, though. It, it seems pretty interesting. As long as I can be a werewolf and thrash all the vampires, I'd be happy with that. <laughs> I need to play the, uh, the werewolf instead of vampire, though. Uh, so you, you can play werewolves in that game? Yeah, so in World of Darkness, you have like the entire vampire rule set, and that's being rebuilt currently. And back in the previous edition, you had also uh, werewolf, which was basically uh, rules only for playing a werewolf. And you had the undeads that you could play. You could play uh, hunted, which is basically a human that is being hunted by different types of things. And mm -hmm. also one where you get to play basically a human mage, I think, uh, something like that. So there's all kinds of it. It's That's really pretty cool. Yeah, at least you don't have to just play vampires. I, yeah, it would be cool to play a werewolf. I would do that. Totally. Vampires are a lot cooler in the mid-90s than they are now. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's sort of like zombies. Zombies are super popular now. You know, yeah. so. So what'd you, when, did you, when did you find out about Sim Butter Room? You know, and so actually, I was playing um, what's it called, the Warhammer Fantasy RPG, uh, with uh, my friend Matthias Lilian uh, a number of years ago, and I didn't know that at the time, but he he was one of the founders of a Swedish RPG developer called Jan Ringen uh, or the Iron Ring, uh, and actually he's the one who introduced me to Symbarum because. Uh, they were developing it, uh, him and, and a couple of other guys, and he wanted us to play test it basically. Uh, so we started uh, playing it for um, 10 or 15 sessions, and I was immediately hooked. Uh, and not long after that, they started, the, um, and he got a kid, so we sort of stopped playing RPGs uh, with him then. Uh, but then they started to kickstart the, the first book of it. Uh, and I'm one of the, I think I, I put in like $250 or something into it. Uh, uh, so if you look in the Swedish version, I'm, I'm one of the crown people or something that is commented in, in it. Oh, that's pretty uh, cool. So I've, I've been playing it since before it was released, basically. But uh, ever since it was released, I've been GMing it nonstop since then, pretty much. So be, before you had this this hairball idea to create a rule set and, and to invest hundreds of hours into doing this, you know, were you using like core RPG? No. So actually, it was um, the other Matthias at uh, Jan Ringen who, who came to me and said that, hey, we want you guys to uh, digitalize uh, Symbarum on some sort of uh, like platform for role-playing games online. And I was like, oh, that sounds great because um, so I'm, I'm run, running a company called Pixel Diet and we're, uh, we're working in the Swedish games industry. So, so I'm a programmer by, by work. Oh, nice. Uh, so uh, I started looking into the different uh, basically uh, platforms that you can develop for. So it was either Roll20 or this and I didn't really like the idea of playing on the web, so I went for, for this one. And I, it, I also saw that on the forums that people were re really active and answering questions and all that. So it looked like a nice place to start uh, doing things at. Uh, so I dove straight into it without even having played one adventure with Fancy Grounds. Oh, wow. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was if you had any kind of like programming knowledge or anything like that. Because uh, the person that I had on last week, last week, Brett, he had no programming knowledge, and he just said, "Hey, I'm going to build this, you know, dungeon crawl classic rule set," and he just asked tons of questions on the forums and learned how to program that way. It, 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 totally amazing. That totally sense. amazing. 
you can totally do that. And and Lua is such a simple language as well, so it's really easy to pick up on. I mean, it's it's written to be easily understood, so uh, it's a really good pick for for that kind of people, uh, for sure. Uh, but I've been I've been programming since I was about twelve, so that's twenty four years. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, so since I was about 16, I have probably spent at least 60 to 70 hours a week. So that's 20 years So I, that I've been pretty much devoting a, a large time of my life into programming. Uh, when it comes to Lua, I've spent probably five or six professional years with Lua. Uh, not exclusively, but part of my work time. Uh, so, for example, I worked with uh, Fat Shark Games to develop uh, Vermintide, which is one of the games that were done uh, with a big chunk of the gameplay code in Lua. So I've had wow. quite the... I worked a lot with Lua, for sure. Well, I'm sure that probably... Because I, I know a lot of Lua is in Fantasy Ground, so I'm sure that just made everything so much easier for you. So how many how many hours total do you have in the development? Of the Simba Room so, rule set. Uh, rule set? It's hard to say because uh, what I do is that I get up at uh, 4.45 every morning and I spend about an hour or so working on, on the rule set before I go to work. Um, and I've been doing that for about a year now. Uh, oh, nice. So right now, but, you, you know, uh, just the, the couple of months leading up to the release, I probably pushed in another five to ten hours a week. So I'm guessing about three or four hundred hours in total, something like that. That's that's pretty good. I mean, how was the how much automation do you think there is in Simba Room, like percentage wise? Oh, that's really hard to say. Um, there's because of the way that this Simba Room rule set is set up. You, there are things that are really hard to automate. So depending on how you take things like that into consideration, but I would say that. Uh, when you look at playtime, I would say that probably around 30, 40% of the roles and things you do are automated. Something like oh, that. That's good. That's really good, especially for the amount of time. I mean, I've, I've talked to a couple of people where they have, I mean, almost a thousand hours invested in the rule sets and have 300, 400 hours. That's, that's impressive, man. Especially to have that automation. Yeah. It's, uh, what I've tried to do is that, uh, so Basically, in Simbrum, all of the roles are made by the players, and uh, the dungeon master doesn't roll anything. So what I've uh, done is basically that uh, the players either like drop their damage or their roll onto the NPC or double click for for using it against their targets. So all of that is automated and like armor calculation and all of that. And oh, so wow. what they do then is that they. Uh, so when uh, an NPC attacks, you basically need to roll your defense, which you just then double click, and then you get like a success rate, and then you can the GM can compare that success rate with the uh, modifier that the the NPC has. So an, an NPC can have like up to plus or minus eight, I think is the most I've seen, uh, minus uh, plus five, minus eight. So it's like. Never mind. It's backward from D D and D, so it's hard to explain. But uh, it sounds get, like uh, sounds something like you know Monty Cook game Numenera, where all of the players make the roles pretty much and yeah. compare versus defense. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I like so, that. Uh, it's pretty good, but there then there's like there's so many spells in uh, <laughs> and artifacts in Sumerum, and some of them are so insane. Like this one where you. If you deal the killing blow with uh, the hammer, uh, you can steal uh, like a spell that the enemy has, the last spell they, they cast it. And then you bind that into the weapon. And then you can cast that and you can cast it with uh, making sure that one of your stats is 15, which is basically max. Uh, and that's like uh, even implementing that would take like 20 or 30 hours. Yeah. So. Instead, Ugh. I've I've just done so that they the player who does it can just drag that spell onto their character sheet and they get it. I mean that's a lot sim simpler. So some of those things will probably never get automated, but I'm looking at automating as, as much as possible as we go down. That's what I was going to ask. Is now that the rule sets out, 
do you plan on developing it more, you know, and listening to the community and trying to do as much within reason to what the community would like to see done with the rule set? Oh, for sure. So um, we're also looking at releasing more modules for, for Sumerum. Actually, the next one, which is the Copper Crown, uh, is about to be done this weekend. So we're going to submit that to Smiteworks uh, probably early next week or this weekend. Um, and after that, we're going to take the advanced players guidebook, I think it's called in English, uh, which contains like more rules uh, that we will also make sure to implement. Uh, and looking forward, I'm, I'm, uh, I feel so invested into this product that I think that I will be supporting and developing for it for at least three or four more years. Wow. Uh, for sure. So you're the only developer. You're basically going to create, continue to work on the rule set, and you're going to, and you're the developer that's doing all of the content as well. Basically, all the modules and everything else. No. So there's one more guy. Uh, he's called Bengin, uh, who also works at my company, uh, and he is basically doing like all of the text and all of the uh, okay. art and all of that conversion. And like converting the the um, that part of the modules, and I'm doing all of the rule and coding. That's rule cool. Coding. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna so say if you were doing all of that, you would. I would just say, dude, you're a machine. <laughs> if you were doing all of that, <laughs> no, not not all of that. No, no. Uh, I'm really glad that he he joined. He joined really quickly. I think I spent like two or three months, and then he hopped on and. Uh, uh, he's been uh, he's been grinding it out and doing long evenings sometimes and just bashing it out really hard. He's a yeah. good, good good guy. That's cool. So does Simba Room? Does the game itself have a lot of content that comes out pretty consistently? Is it is it a, is it a nicely supported game with lots of fresh content? Basically, I, I would say so. They're releasing um, so there's um, a huge campaign going on in in the world which is called. Um, that's in English, uh, the throne of thorn, uh, throne of thorns in English. Yeah. And they just kickstarted the fifth, fourth book, the fourth out of six books in that huge campaign. Oh, and wow. each of the books, not only the, the, uh, like adventure, but there's also like, they go through like uh, a new part of the world, like a new city or, uh, there's a, a place uh, where sort of like the witches have a council in the in the forest, uh, which is like a huge plateau, which is one of the books. So it not only brings like a few new rules and a few new artifacts and all that into it, but a huge adventure as well as as like uh, tons of minor intrigues that you can play. So they're pretty big, and I think there's. Uh, there's uh, four of those out now. There will, will be two more the coming years. Uh, you have the Advanced Players Guidebook, Handbook, or whatever it's called. Uh, the Copper Crown, which we're releasing uh, now soon. You also have oh. the Monster Codex, which is a book of only new monsters. And oh. then you have um, a few smaller uh, adventure packs as well. I think there's four of them or something. Well, that's pretty impressive. So yeah, it's they're, they're working really hard, uh, and our goal is to support all of them. Uh, yeah. So that's the long goal, but we don't know how long time that will take. But the Copper Crown has taken about two months, I think, two months of work wow. uh, for Bengit to convert. So, so how long has Simbaroon been out since the Kickstarter and and they actually release release the products? Oh, uh, four years. That's a pretty good amount of content for four years, to be honest. You know, to have a, yeah. an advanced book come out and, you know, four parts of a six part adventure and other modules and a code. That's pretty impressive. I think it is, it's four or five years. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. Look that up. It's hard to say. Uh, but I know that 2016 was Distilhood, 2016. So 2015. Yeah, that's about four years. Four or five years. So where is the company based out of? So um, they were recently merged with another company. So uh, they used to be called Jan Ringen, and they were the company, and I think there were four or five people in it. 
uh, and they merged with um, uh, Fria Liga or the Fria League, which has done a lot of other games. And they recently announced their new game, which is Alien. Uh, that IP. Uh, oh, they actually, actually got the Alien IP. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you should see that. It looks looks really awesome. Um, wow. So, and they're based in in Stockholm, but. Matthias, who is writing most of the content, uh, he's based up in northern Sweden. And the guy who is writing the rules is in Stockholm. And the artist who's doing all of the fantastic artwork for Simberm is also in Stockholm. That's awesome. So is this game, is it basically created in, in Swedish and also English? Or are there other languages that it's, it's translated into? Oh, it's translated into Spanish, French. Uh, German, I think. Wow. And a couple of more languages. I don't remember. But I know that it's really big in Brazil, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. It's, it's getting traction in the States as well, I, I've heard. And, and it's pretty big in, in Europe, for sure. Uh, the, I know that the, I think it was the Spanish or the French one has a lot of uh, printed copies. Wow. And this so. is only with a five five-person company? Yeah. Wow, that's it's impressive. Insane. Yeah. But they're not doing the translation. So it's basically people from the community who has uh, read the English version. And they said, like, we want to do this in Spanish. And, and Matias and the other people are like, sure. Uh, as long as you can deliver a good product, we're, we're all up for it. Uh, oh, that's good. So I, I think that's one of the ways that they managed to spread it so much. And, and they're really helpful. And... Like Matthias is always there if you have questions or there's things that you want to like discuss re regarding how to implement the rule set and all that. They're so helpful. Um, so th th that has helped me a lot because there's been some of the... I had some issues with how to implement some of the automation and I've just run it through him a couple of times and that has helped me so much. Well, well. That's cool. It's pretty impressive, man. Especially if you got, you know, folks living in the northern part of Sweden and in Stockholm and to make that all that come together. That's 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 really good. That's you know, that's another a great thing about fantasy grounds too, is everybody's in different parts of the country. So we have, you know, Seattle, there's gonna be Nevada pretty soon. I'm in El Paso, there's Florida. I mean it's it's uh, it's crazy. How mm -hmm. you know, an online environment can just like bring a company together it's it's awesome i i have to say that that uh the the community that fancy grounds has is the best i've ever seen yeah uh, i agree uh damned or damien that's on the discord server he's helped me so much without him uh the rule set what would not have been even close to what it is today he's answered so many questions and helped me out with so many things he helped out with uh, some of the graphics for for the module as well, and that is just totally unseen anywhere else. Yeah, he yeah, that's what Brett was saying last week. Brett said that mm -hmm. Damien helped him a lot. He said if it wasn't for Damien, he probably wouldn't have learned as much as he did, and probably no. not even happened since he was saying that too. So, mm -hmm. a lot yeah, of people. Awesome, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no there, there's other people that's been helping as well, especially, uh, especially since the module was released. Uh, there's a, a thread on the Core RPG uh, forum where people have been uh, sending in bugs and like uh, making sure to like uh, mention the things that they see are troublesome or the, the way they want things to develop. And it, it helps me so much because then a lot of the decisions that I'm unsure where to go it's just so easy to make all the time. Yeah. Plus, it's you know, like free QA, which is also awesome. There's some sure. people in chat saying that Damien is a robot or an automaton <laughs> and he doesn't sleep. <laughs> he is. Yeah, there's Celestian too. Celestian made the Advanced Dungeons uh -huh. & Dragons rule set. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think... I think uh, he picked uh, Damien's brain as well. So Damien definitely knows his stuff. That's for sure. So oh, yeah. he definitely does. And, and we, when he does, he knows who to point, point people to as well. He's yeah. Like, Ask this. He's written that part of the core RPG. He knows all about it. I'm like, oh, wow. And I think <laughs> Celestine is probably one of the people I've talked to. I've talked to plenty of the, of the community. And, and I don't even remember who anymore because it's been so many. Yeah. That's... 
the one of the first things I noticed about the Fantasy Grounds forums was, I mean, you could be brand new and 20 people will jump in and, you know, hey, you, you need to do this or that or and it's mm-hmm. it, it's such a strong community I mean, because because, I you know, I read a lot of RPG communities and forums and man, some of them are just so bad and you just you don't ever yeah. want to go back to them. But uh, not yeah. here, man. No, it's 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 a top notch community, and a lot of people say that too. You know, I'm just not saying it because I work for Fantasy Grounds, but mm-hmm. I always said that before I even became an employee with the company. So yeah, yeah, it was awesome. It's impressive for sure. So, what kind of games do you got going on now, Simon? What what kind of games are you playing? Are you running any? Um, so I'm running one uh, Simburm campaign. I used to run another one, but that's been sort of on pause because we were trying out um, uh, the Genesis rule set with um, Realms of Chernoff. Uh, but that's gone so-so, so we're not playing uh, that much at the moment. But then I'm running this Simurum group, which has been going on for about a year. Yeah, a year, maybe more. Uh, yeah, probably a bit more. Uh, and we're just moving into the first book of the campaign. Um, and uh, we're probably going to keep playing for a few years, it looks like. So it's a really good group. Um, and other than that, I have some few one-offs that I do every year uh, with some friends, which is mostly Symbarum. Um, but also, I am a player in a D&D group with uh, a very good friend of, of mine who is an awesome GM. And we're we're playing the um, uh, the one I told you about. You're playing the Annihilation campaign, right? Yeah, Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah. And we're we've just uh, reached Omu, and it's it's brilliant. We're having so oh, much yeah. fun. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I like we were talking before the stream. I love the open world part of that. You know, the traveling, the hex traveling. I mean, it yeah, reminds that's... me so much of basic D&D and X1, you know, the Isle of Dread with all the dinosaurs. I mean, that was so fun to do. Isn't it actually the Isle of Dread that they've, like, modernized and taken into this one? I think that's where Chult is probably based of, yeah. Yeah. I do believe. Well, I ran that for my players, and they loved it. You know, all the the random encounters and and the story plot. And plus I kind of, I did a little bit of quantum leaping. If you ever seen that show back from the eighties, quantum leap, I would, Mm -hmm. I would take him from, you know, the world of D and D and then we'd go to like the savage world's 50 fathoms world. And then we'd, you know, come back to the D and D world. So that, that was kind of fun to kind of throw haymakers at him like that. Hmm. So about Simbaram, yeah. What what are the what are the most interesting features that you like about the game? Is it is it like the character customization, or is it just like some some of the the core rules? Or um, actually, the, the the thing I like the most about it is definitely the story and the world. And I'm currently proofreading the fourth book, which is um, Mother of Darkness, I think it is, and. Um, the the world and how they just keep going deeper into like this world surrounding story is is what completely sells me. Uh, the um, I, I kind of like the ability and mystical power system that like characters are quite flexible, um, but I've never been much of a uh, very fond of of as a GM playing with uh, uh, only like a D twenty system. I really like the the Genesis system more for that. Uh, although as a player, I think I I might prefer the D and D system more. Uh, is for, it Genesis? Isn't that Fantasy Flight Games? Isn't that like the Warhammer Fifth Edition and the Star Wars Fantasy Flight? The, the yes. same type of dice pool mechanics, right? Oh, button again. Yeah, that, that, yeah. I love that dice mechanic system. I hated mm-hmm. it at first, but when I actually figured it out and when i started understanding it i was like wow this makes sense especially for like a more heavy role-playing dm like myself because mm-hmm. I, I like the roles and you're successful but this happens or you fail but this super duper awesome thing happens so yeah i do like genesis 
yeah, it's and it, I mean it's it's all up to how you want to play the the game and what kind of DM you have, uh, and I think yeah. that's why I'm doing the D and D campaign as well because um, my my GM there he he's been playing D and D for probably uh, I think since third uh, three point five came out basically, uh, yeah, so he's well. a hardcore D and D fan and he's great at GMing and so the, but I I don't think I could make that fun and not like to the level that he's doing it um but back to simbarum uh it's like uh, when you start going deeper under the story than just is what is presented to you in like the basic book then there's there's so much dirt and there's nobody's the good guy <laughs> but there's definitely a lot of bad guys <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and you like yeah, when you follow the campaign, like you can see how how players will just try to be the good people all the time or the bad people all the time, but they're not going to manage to be either of that because uh, both ways are impossible. Basically, yeah, I like it. So many, yeah. I like it when RPGs incorporate you know full dedicated sections to villains and other NPCs and mm -hmm. organizations to where you're just not following the story. You have all these other plot points that you can just throw in, yes. you know, all these evil organizations and mm -hmm. the bad guys. And yeah, they seem like, you know, they're, they're great for the town and, you know, they always donate to the orphanages, but secretly they have this laboratory in their castle and they're just like stealing all the souls of the children and stuff. I mean, it's just like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> And I li like as well how you can, like, when you play a game where, where uh, like, everything is so rough and, and uh, people get corrupted and tainted and dirty all the time, I had this one session where we played, uh, where they just came to an inn where they had to rest, and it turns out that uh, one of the children seems like she had a really, really bad rash on, like, the inside <laughs> of her thigh. <laughs> uh, and it turns out later that a, like a, it's sort of like the boy from one of those horror movies that just co comes out and kicks you in the shin and then points at you and laughs at you and then runs away. And he's gone for like two days. And eventually they find him in the forest eating uh, a bird uh, <laughs> with a nasty ass talisman around his, his neck. And it turns into this flesh monster of savage black goo that just rips out at them with huge nasty fangs and teeth and claws. And then when the guy kicks the girl, he gave her the funk too. So now she's got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, yeah. about the Simba room rule set, you know, you, you say you want to keep advancing it. What kind of, what kind of features, you know, what kind of features do you want to see be implemented later on down the line? Well, mostly I want to make sure that it's easier to customize the rule set because right now there's a lot of that lack. Uh, so that's sort of my main focus while making things easier. So I want to make people able to completely customize like gear and artifacts and weapons and all that. And it's really uh, tight bound. So you can only select like it's going to be a short weapon or a long weapon or ranged weapon, all of that. And they all have predefined damages and all of that. So I want to take that that kind of things uh, deeper and make it possible to, to build your own mystical powers and combine them in different ways. Um, so I think that's going to be a, a pretty big part going forward. Uh, and it also, I mean, it depends on what the community wants. If there's people who say that we would like this part automated or this part, part automated, I will definitely go for that. That's cool. Uh, mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. like... Uh, Things like alchemy is even when you go through the rules in in the normal like uh, paper books, uh, alchemy is it's hard to work with because like the different elixirs and potions that you can make are all spread out on, on different parts of the rule book. So I want to sort of make that easier and more accessible. That's cool. So is there a is there a pretty robust crafting system in the game as well? I wouldn't say so. Uh, they've added uh, some sort of smithing later on, uh, but but uh, when it comes to elixirs and potions, there's a lot of them that you can can uh, make basically. But it's really simple. But that's not something that I've actually implemented much in the rule set. 
That's cool. Uh, mm-hmm. Things like that. Um, but uh, as well, like when, when we make the uh, advanced player handbook, that one has a lot of new rules. Like it has more spells or mystical powers, which is called, and rituals and sort of like elite classes, sort of. Um, but Simurum is a sort of like a classless ish uh, system. You can pick whatever abilities or traits you want to. Um, but I want to get all of that into the game and all of the new that includes and all of the new abilities. I see a lot of the a, a lot of the newer games are kind of shying away. Button. Yeah, oh, wrong button actually. So <laughs> yeah, I, I've noticed that with a lot of the newer rule sets and games coming out. You know, a lot of games are going away from the you know typical D twenty type of class structure. You know, I, I know Savage Worlds. That that was that's a good you know way of displaying. You know, you got your edges, your hindrances, and you know all of your skills that you can upgrade. So it, I I do like that actually, because it gives you just more more ways and more freedom to to kind of customize everything. Because I mean, if you're yeah. playing a fighter, sure, take some spells, take some magic. I mean, why not? So. You sort of already have that in D and D in one way because of multiple classes. Yeah, yeah. So, but but it's still, um, uh, I like both ways because uh, I'm playing like a druid in the in our D and D session, and I really like that I can see how my character will be built in the in the future, and I can have like expectations of what spells I'm gonna get, and I can see the like study of all of the spells that I know that I'm gonna get, and all. I love that part. And at the same time, when you're playing like a classless system, you get to sit and spend time on determining what uh, abilities or traits or whatever you're getting. Uh, like in the Genesis system, when you get your, um, it's called something else, but it's basically uh, an ability. So are there prerequisites? So you have to have this before you can take this ability or something like that? Yeah, that's good. I like that. Just to where it's not like totally open and, Everybody just goes for the massive power strike at the at the very beginning, you know. Exactly. I like and, the restrictions. Uh, things that they actually managed sort of pretty good with the Simbarum rule set is that, like, if you want to pick um, a mystical power, you can basically do that. You can pick whichever you want if you have a trainer or a book that you can can use for it. But it gives you a permanent corruption, and permanent corruption is really really something that you don't want because it lowers your like corruption threshold uh which means that you can cast less spells before you become this flesh beast that eats your friends wow (laughs) wow (laughs) yeah you have that kind of mechanic that balances out that you can you can attain some power but it sort of has a attained on you i mean there's ways to get rid of those but it's it's expensive and it's hard and it's you might have to you know like murder somebody that's high in the in the church and steal some sort of like holy water from them something like that so uh it has its disadvantages for sure nice so do you want to take a couple of uh questions before we wrap things up here in a couple minutes yeah, we'll uh, sure. we'll go to the audience, and if you guys out there have any questions for Simon or any questions about the Simbada Room rule set, feel free to ask them now or forever. Hold your peace. Yeah, I know that somebody asked what the the that was earlier. How warm it is in Sweden right now, and currently it's about twenty six degrees Celsius. It was twenty eight today, which is really really warm. It was. 12 degrees like two weeks ago wow so it's the summer just hit us we've already had a couple days here in the desert here in el paso at 100 degrees so i think what is it uh if i'm not mistaken it's probably about 40 degrees off from what celsius is i think i think i remember somebody describing a fahrenheit that's 100 degrees fahrenheit is really real warm yeah (laughs) If there's humidity, but here in the desert, we don't have any humidity. So that makes it, makes it a little bit easier on us. But if it's a hundred degrees in Florida, wow, man, you're melting because of the, you know, hundred plus degree humidity. Oh, right. So it's about, yeah, it's 38 degrees Celsius. That is 
that's really warm. <laughs> yeah. I did see a couple of people mention uh, about the Somebody Room rule set that they love the monster book and they love the monster layout of the book. Yeah, so the, the monster is like written as sort of like a manual in the game world, basically. Oh, nice. So is it just, does it have a lot of information and plot points and hook points? That's good because I, I don't like monster manuals that are just solid walls of monster stat blocks. Exactly. So, yeah. it has, um, so there's, I don't remember how, I think it's about 30 monsters that each have uh, a plot to them. So they have like different ways that you can throw them into a scenario or create a scenario of them that they have uh, specific examples of and also like some history over uh, somebody in Umbria, which is the, the, the new country that the humans moved to in the world um, that has, you know, like been eaten or killed somehow with it or a vill village that has been tainted and died because of something. All of that is described for every monster. So um, it's really good in that way that if you just have that book and the rule book, you can create tons of adventures really easily. That's good. Yeah, I, I can't stand just walls of text of, you know, numbers and, yeah. Yeah, Bella says that it's uh, 100 degrees Fahrenheit now in Sweden if it's 38 degrees Celsius. Oh, that's hot, man. That is hot. Uh, that <laughs> is really, really hot. <laughs> Guacamole saying that he's afraid to open his Simba Room books now because of the flesh-eating monsters. <laughs> So th th that's like one of the very interesting mechanics uh, in Symbarum that uh, I think is quite unique for it. So uh, everybody has sort of this um, like corruption, which is sort of like a wound system that you gain corruption. And either you gain permanent corruption or temporary corruption. And the, the temporary corruption is for from using artifacts or getting hit, hit by a corrupted monster or uh, using your spells. Um, and uh, after one scene, your temporary corruption goes away, but your permanent corruption always stay. And as soon as your permanent plus temporary corruption reaches up to the same level as your resolute, which is between 5 and 15, then you become a flesh-eating monster. Oh, wow. And, you and try to kill them. So it's, it's basically like the insanity rules in like Call of Cthulhu or something yeah. then, right? Oh, that's exactly. that's cool. Yeah, that's one reason why I never got on a Call of Cthulhu because it's just <laughs> inevitable you're going to die from insanity. So, <laughs> I mean, I think every session you start out with that. But I mean, something like, you know, the flesh eating mechanic, that mm -hmm. makes Simba Room a unique game that most yeah. games won't even touch any kind of mechanic like that. So, as long as there's ways to like temper it and stuff, I, I love stuff like that. And, you know, the, the, a good thing is like the monster codex is a really good example here because in that one, there is a monster who doesn't uh, give you corruption. It takes away your permanent corruption. But when it does that, it becomes stronger. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, have... there's something bad that goes along with that, right? <laughs> yeah. So I've thrown one of those into uh, it was like one of the first adventures for the, the current group I'm playing with that I threw that in for them. And it was like weakened because it had been in a jail for, you know, like four or five hundred years and starved. So it was like a really light version of it. Uh, that picked away some of their early corruption and they they could escape from it, but they actually managed to kill it because I'd given them a tool to do it and they figured it out and did it, which was very funny. Um, but uh, there, and the thing about the corruption is that it it permeates the entire world, like all of the story, everything, everything is associated with it. And I think that's that's the thing that I really enjoy about uh, the Symburm. Um because the, the forest, the deeper you go into the forest, the more corrupted it becomes. And the more tainted and awful things you will see coming at you. That's good. Which is, yeah. And all, there's tons of ruins inside of it that also either are like corrupted areas or they have uh, tainted artifacts so that you gain some power from them. But you can't use them too much because then you 
then you eat your friends. <laughs> and, you know, plus that keeps your players on your toes as well. So it, yeah. it always makes them think, well, do we want to go here or do we want to go deeper in the forest or, or what? Yeah, that's good. So do you have anything else going on that you want to talk about? Any other top secret fantasy grounds rule sets being developed or anything like that? Or just oh, stick it with Simbarum? Right <laughs> <laughs> no, it's only Simbarum right now. Uh, I might be looking into more rule sets in the future. Uh, with uh, Fria Liga, um, we haven't uh, we have discussed that we might do it in the future. We haven't discussed which one or when we're supposed to begin or whatever. Uh, but I know that's definitely a possibility. Uh, so it depends on how much time I get and how fast we convert all of the content to this one. Uh, that's cool. But given the amount of knowledge that I have now with uh, fancy grounds, like converting something that is an easier rule set than Symbarum. Like if you look at the, the different ones, the mutant, for example, that Free Vegan has, it will take a lot less time than this one did. So we always, always have that to consider as well. Kabengen said he's your biggest fan, he or she. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that's, that your fan? Is that your friend, right? That, that's the guy I'm doing with it. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, he works within uh, Quality Assurance, so it's QA for Quality Assurance, and uh, Bengen is his name. That's cool. <laughs> he's a fan, yeah, right. <laughs> well, all right. I'm not going to keep you anymore. You know, it's getting late over there in Sweden. So, you know, it was really nice talking to you, Simon. It was really nice meeting you. And I enjoy yeah. these. I love just talking with other gamers, you know, and hearing yeah. about, you know, what they play and what they yeah. like. And it's great. I really appreciate you coming on. It was uh, nice. Th thanks for having me on. This was, this was awesome. And I'd love to do it uh, more sometime in the future when we have more of Symbarum and maybe another rule set going on. That's cool. Well, uh, we'll definitely have you back on. So I'm going to let you go and thank you to everybody for hanging out for another fantasy grounds Fridays. Happy gaming, everybody. I hope you guys, uh, Roll a lot of 20s or roll a bunch of aces if you're playing Savage Worlds and have a great weekend of gaming and we'll see you again next Friday. I'll be I'll be doing something next Friday. So I'll see you guys at 12 p.m. Eastern Center Time. And once again, my name is David and this is Simon with the Sim Butter Room rule set. And uh, thanks for watching and happy gaming and see you next Friday. Bye, everybody. Bye.